Mei Yin and have been working with uh, Andy Horowitz to put together this series of talks. And thanks for coming. I'm amazed at the turnout. It's good. Um, I'll let Andy explain why we're all looking at each other and not you. That's, you know, it's just too experimental for me. Um, why did I ring the bell? This is, um, we rang this bell uh, the night after Ellen Stewart died two years ago. And uh, so just as a, uh, as a commemoration of that, uh, when we started, Ellen used to open all of her shows, ringing a bell and then reading the program, which I will uh, spare you. <laughs> uh, and then, um, but anyway, just to uh, sanctify the space. So, Andy, are you ready, or should I say some more things? No, I, I can talk, you know. I Thank know. you to the public theater. That's where you are, actually. It all belongs to the public theater, and we only get to inhabit it for like two weeks. We're a project of the public theater. Yeah. Very good. Um, great. So, I am um, Andy. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Mark, and Megan, and everybody. Um, I'll come stand over here for now. Um, so um, this conversation is uh, just a little bit of explaining why it's set up the way it is. Last year, uh, we did a couple of conversations um, during Under the Radar. Mark invited us in. Um, and we did one um, on visual art performance versus contemporary performance. It was really interesting, but afterwards we had a lot of really great people come up and go, you know, the presentational aesthetics of the panel format reinforced the hierarchy, the power hierarchies that you're trying to subvert. And I was like, you're totally right. Um, and in the, we had been talking to Lois Weaver. Um, Lois Weaver is this amazing artist and director um, and just a real um, inspiration. And she has had developed this, this, this framework called The Long Table, which is based on the movie Antonia's Line, where um, she keeps inviting more and more people to dinner, and the table gets longer and longer, and they finally have to move out into the yard. And um, it's sort of this um, uh, horizontal platform for, for discourse to try and sort of make it more porous um, and to allow people to have a sort of conversational approach towards big ideas. Um, and so we decided to do this year's conversations in this format. Um, at the moment, uh, there, are, there are one, two empty seats. Um, uh, if you know at some point during the conversation you're moved to like ask a question or participate, you can take a seat. Um, the, the, in the front of your program, there's a, a long table etiquette and sort of some helpful rules of how it works. Um, one of the things that uh, we wanted to do uh, also is everyone has name uh, tags in front of them or name plates in front of them. Everyone's bios are in the. Um, Program. I mean, we want to, you know, a lot of the panel formats sort of you take 45 minutes with everybody explaining who they are and what they do. Um, and we didn't, we wanted to really sort of skip that part. Um, we have amazing people at the table. You can identify them. Um, and I'm sure from their remarks, they will contextualize themselves as well. Um, and uh, so that's the, that's the basic format. We will, um, uh, continue, we will uh, normally, uh, so it's, it's, it's an unmoderated discussion, there's no opening statements, there's no formal statements, um, there is a host, uh, Barbara Lanciers was going to be our host, but she was felled by a rather nasty flu that's going around, um, from which I have just recovered, almost, and I will be uh, hosting for a little while. Um, so, and we will continue until 1.30 when, um, uh, do you want to ring the bell at 1.30 or shall I? Uh, someone else should. Someone else should, okay. I will ring the bell. Um, and, you know, if people feel like that they have to, you know, get a, you know, step out for a second, they're free to do so. Uh, you're free to tap, try and tap in if you're like, I really have something to say. Uh, uh, and, you know, people are free to say no. So, um, and that's why, unfortunately, this area we can't go to because of the paper, but, uh, you know, Think of it as a as a as a group conversation. So, um, on that note, 
Um, good morning, everyone. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm very impressed that everyone uh, made it made it so early on a Saturday. Um, and uh, when um, Mayin and I were um, talking about what conversations to have, you know, during the festival and what would sort of relate to the program and what are the conversations that maybe are happening in the cocktail lounge but uh, aren't necessarily being, you know, had in public, <laughs> um, maybe we could find a way to address some of those things in a, in a, in a thoughtful, you know, non, you know, um, lower the temperature a little bit um, and just have a conversation about um, the changes that are happening in the wake of the economy, um, both in America and Europe. And, um, um, you know, and see how, how uh, Ellen and I were talking right before it started, and it's like, well, do we want to talk about, uh, uh, you know, what's happening right now? Do we want to talk about sort of how we got into this? Do we want it? And um, I think, you know, obviously, I think the things that, in, that, that inspired me and Megan and I were one, um, you know, how is this going to affect, how, how does the change in, in economic climate, I mean, it's an interesting, because I it's an interesting question. I mean, is the change in America's economy going to actually change much of anything? Because uh, our funding for going abroad has traditionally been less than 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 Europe. Is the, are the changes in Europe going to affect the way we culturally exchange? And uh, I think the question is also like, well, what is the what can we imagine the future holds, and how how are we going to adapt to that? So, um, and I, personally, I was all, I'm also really interested to think about. Um, uh, the aesthetic issues, um, particularly, um, uh, I think we've seen, particularly in this year's festival, when we look at um, under the radar the work that's in there with uh, Hollow Roots and Debate Society and um, ERS's Arguendo, um, but then also if we look at like American Realness and some of the other work, I mean, I think we're seeing a, 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 a sort of uh, cla a, a claiming of a sort of American DIY aesthetic that, that that has been sort of not owned for a long time because uh, and I'm wondering if if, if that, that that aesthetic shift might uh, inform the conversation and of course the larger issues of like cultural diplomacy so um, I don't know uh, that DIY aesthetic uh, aesthetic you know which is sort of a that's been Americans' aesthetic for a long time. That's what we do. Um, I think for <coughs> my perception was that in many cases, some of the European countries would, uh, were very interested in that. And uh, just in the way that our artists made things, even from the 70s, 60s on through. And, um, and that influenced the way they made things. And they took it on into a uh, more European context. And, funded it better and, and gave them more tools, uh, <clears throat> to be honest. Um, but of course, one of the things I'm seeing is that uh, many of the governments uh, over in Europe especially are turning more conservative and defunding the arts and using the US as an icon. Like, uh, if they can do it that way, then we should. Uh, that that's the wave of the future, you know, make the arts sit on their own bottom, this stuff, I think. Uh, and a lot of it is right wing um, uh, inspired because it can uh, defund and uh, uh, isolate the intelligentsia and uh, other alternative ways of uh, thinking about the world. And <clears throat> I think a lot of people over there were caught um, uh, by surprise, thinking that uh, these things were sort of facts of the culture, that culture is, uh, is supported by the state, and uh, every, every city should have a cultural house like PS 122 and a big uh, opera theater and things should grow up that way. And now those uh, assumptions are being very much shaken. Um, and it's a very scary time, I think, over there. And we're always scared. <laughs> it's just, but we're so scared, or we're, whatever, we're just used to it. Um, 
it, it makes me feel a little bit like, uh, well, the, the theater is always this, uh, what, the fabulous invalid? And um, it's very interesting as the theater continues doing its thing that people like radio and music business and uh, even uh, broadcast television are, uh, are scrambling for new models. And we're, we, can, we can teach them something. Anyway, that's a lot of what's going on in what I'm seeing out there out of this crash. Did you find, are you finding programming more difficult as a result because you're, you, you're feeling the effects of less funding or less work is available to tour or has it actually not had yet much of an impact? It, it's having an impact. Um, this is the first year in many years that we haven't had something from from Ireland and supported by Culture Ireland and it was a great relationship we had and I think we were able to help launch several of their artists or give them a really good platform for to see what's going on in Ireland in that rich rich uh, theater scene there um, but the Culture Ireland's getting got a little remodeling over the last year and uh, they're not able to uh, assist us as much as they would like um, so it's uh, there's certain gaps. There's I, I can see this becoming a bigger problem down the line. The the joke always is that um, you pay to come to New York and then you pay New York artists to come to you, and there's always a little bit of a chip. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and it was I was always that's one reason I was interested in. I've been always trying to struggle to um, make that more of a parody. And uh, it's becoming a parody, whether I like it or not. <laughs> but, but, but the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. 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 I believe that the crisis in Europe, you have to talk about it in different ways. I, I believe that we have countries that really, really struggle because of the economy. Yeah. And that is why they cannot support the arts. Yeah. And then you have countries that can take a more ideological place and see, OK, we have a crisis. Um, people don't want to pay the taxes. Okay, let's get rid of the arts. It's different ways. And then you have countries that still have the same support towards the arts and the culture in Europe. So from, from a European point of view, you have to differ those yeah, actions. Not monolithic. And, uh, and from Sweden, we can see we still have a, a budget that is okay. It's not, it hasn't been cut. But our artists, they struggle because they cannot tour, they cannot get out, because they will not get paid enough, and we cannot support them entirely. Mm -hmm. So of course the internationalization will suffer from it, even though separate countries may mm -hmm. still have a large budget or support the arts or mm -hmm. find new ways. That <coughs> I believe that is what we will see, how we co-produce in the future, right. we have one strong state, in a week, how can they together co-produce equally? Mm -hmm. So that I think we will see in Europe anyhow. Yeah. If, I, if I could add something, because I think the, the problem is even deeper. We tend to look at governments right and left wing. In Holland, they did a research on the voters, and the people wanted to uh, to get budget cuts which were higher than what we are spending on government. I mean, I think that is really a, a, a big problem. If, if the people you cannot uh, you know, convince the people that you should spend money on culture, then you know, then it's going to be difficult. And, and we were just discussing it. In Holland is going on for two years. And to be quite honest, I love culture and I hope it will stay there. I didn't hear a convincing. I can make for myself, but I didn't hear it in, 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 the, in the newspapers. And then the next step, why should you spend money to present yourself I agree. I, I think there's actually sort of two narratives disentangle them, especially when it comes to and the whole context around cultural diplomacy and exchange. And there's sort of two storylines which are connected but really separate. One is the sort of inevitable breakdown of the welfare state because it's unsustainable economically. So later there was going to be a questioning of 
generous uh, European system. It's been exacerbated by the economic crisis. It's been accelerated, but we knew that that. But now it's really that's one story. I think the other story is the the which is the surprising. the challenging of the idea of Europe and the fact that not only a strong divide between countries that are going backwards Budapest and Hungary if you read the new article this week in the New Yorker finally there are countries which are literally uh, disavowing the sort of Western values that we thought that they would uh, naturally <coughs> assume after they the frame for maybe that we should be talking about because it seems to be a strong rationale anymore for cultural engagement. You know, America won stories that, you know, Cold War's over and it was assumed that everybody from Prague to Budapest, etc. will sign strong, quick decline in American cultural diplomacy. Interestingly, now we have a new rationale. I mean, you could probably argue that from Moscow to Budapest, there's now sort of a need again to assert some of those positive values, both inside Europe and from the United States to Europe. Mm -hmm. Yes, I definitely agree that the, the situation is much more Eastern Europe, yeah, whatever that means. Um, in a way, we, um, we, I mean, the, 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 the performing arts, so the system, the capitalism, the system that has already collapsed um, 20 years and um, I don't know what is the situation in Croatia or in Hungary, but in Poland it's only now that we are, that, that we about the transformation and the costs of the transformation of the change of the system. <coughs> and to speak about the situation that maybe it was not on some parts of the societies paid too much for that. For instance, The other is that uh, there are a lot of um, yeah, financial uh, um, mm, 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 sciences, let's say, who try to, um, to, to, to convince all the politicians that the way of really sort of um, still well existing way of um, public support for the development of the culture shall not exist anymore that way because it's just too expensive. So this is one thing. And the other, it's just like one way of thinking among the politicians. And uh, on the other hand, there are artists who, st who like realize that we really in a way benefit still from the system and it would be wonderful if we could sustain, if we could make it sustainable. But, and, and what was really um, in a way funny uh, was that there was a series of meetings with uh, Frédéric Martel, who used to be the, yeah, the, the culture oh, attaché of, yeah, of, of France uh, here <coughs> in the US, and he wrote a, a marvelous book about the cultural policy, or actually the, of, of the way of non-existing cultural policy in the US. Mm. And he was in a way used, or he, he, he even was, I mean, he, it was his idea to go to come to, to run some meetings and to speak about the danger of, of, of giving up with that system. <coughs> so that was really, so in a way this, this example of, of, of the ideal system was for the very first time used as a very bad one. Mm. That was interesting. Mm. Yeah. I think there's a big difference between Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Talk about gold. I mean, the gold was seen were the spokesmen of the system until 89. And in Hungary you still see if, if there's a cultural organization that is criticizing anything of the government, it's gonna, it's the, the wings are being cut. I mean, we don't have that in Western Europe. Yes. I mean, that both were instruments, I, I think, in the in the Cold War period to, to, to show how how you know, how well develop, developed you were, uh, we were. And I think that was even the reason for the U.S. to do a little bit on 
cultural uh, uh, policy to, to show like we are not uh, we are better than the Russians. Mm -hmm. But at, at very now, I mean that there's a huge difference between between Eastern Europe or Central Europe and, and Western Europe. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think also what what happened in Europe, particularly from uh, the Dutch side and the Western European countries, where there was much more when it started the cultural diplomacy, much more uh, both ways uh, way of thinking. Uh, maybe because of the whole Europe becoming one, you see now also in Holland, uh, where we used to be very much about enriching our own culture from cultures from abroad, it's now much more sending our culture, like we need to kind of like make a stand on to happen in the Western European countries a lot more, we want to show that we're still there separately instead of, you know, all working together. I mean, what Mark talked about in terms of culture Ireland, um, it was certainly the case right after the crash, um, you know, there were cuts uh, in arts funding, but in that first year post-crash, uh, culture Ireland actually increased the budget, particularly around the Imagine Ireland programme. And, you know, the thing that was completely apparent was that the only positive new story that was possible to project around Ireland at that point was cultural activity. Um, and on the one hand, the you know, the, you're moving into the territory of culture, culture being instrumentalised and being used as as PR. But it, but you know, it felt that the, 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 the government there was no other way of promoting a positive image of the culture of the country at that point other than through culture. What's happened subsequently is that. Um, I mean, anyway, it's possible that culture has been a victim of its own success, and actually, the department, the government department, has wanted to take some of that responsibility back into itself because culture Ireland was having all of this sort of uh, sexy international success, and the department, so the culture Ireland was making things possible, whereas the Department of Arts was cutting stuff. So this restructuring partly is about being able to take credit for that, but it, it feels now what's happened is that. Uh, you know, I mean, it's interesting that the cuts are not so severe, and in fact, the cuts to the arts budget to the to the Irish Arts Council are less than the cuts across the board. And actually, the cut that the Arts Council has passed on to the artists is less than the cut that was given to the Arts Council by the government. But even so, it feels like um, there's having to be a. It, there's, it's a lot about stability now, and when you start talking about stability, it means less project funding for new work. Um, and it, it's the case that, it, in a way, the thing that sustained the independent scene in Ireland. Uh, in the time immediately post-crash was the fact that Culture Ireland was supporting work to have longer lives. So work, uh, you know, newer companies were able to tour work and the work was able to have a life. It feels now like we're, uh, people are kind of clinging to each other for warmth a little bit more. Mm. Um, and we're not quite sure uh, what's going to happen now. The current round of funding has, um, uh, is very much about maintaining what's happening and is less about, you know, what might happen. And so who knows? But it, it, that, that, that's... Um, in a way, being able to talk, uh, to use the language of promoting the image of the culture abroad is, is one of the things that will maintain some of that support, but then we, we run the risk of instrumentalizing what we're doing um, and it becoming a promotional tool rather than something that has an intrinsic value in itself. Yeah, we, we see that happening in Holland also from uh, the governmental point of view that now what is important is the top segment, it's the, mm -hmm. it's the theater group Amsterdam's, the mm -hmm. Royal Concertgebouw Orchestras, because that's where you can kind of score, so to speak, uh, and indeed the, the young development uh, where the production houses are leaving. And, and it's a shame in a way because from an artist's point of view, I felt that the younger generation, the newer generation, was actually already, in Holland at least, was already really starting to look at different ways of funding themselves, at different ways of collaborating. I feel maybe also because of the whole in, uh, uh, internet and everything, their generation, I feel like they were already much more looking outside their own borders, mm -hmm. making co-productions, co-collaborating, <coughs> which I feel might be the new way of making international well, I mean, work. I mean, fundamentally, I think our problem is that all of our systems, you know, United States, rich Western countries, I mean, they're all national systems still. Right. Yes. So even in the United States where you say the non-existing cultural policy, there's a very clear cultural policy. It's sort of a default cultural policy, but the reality is that all of our funding mechanisms, I mean, 99.9% .9 are domestic. And they rest on completely outdated assumptions. I mean, I always say our cultural policy is sort of like our farming policy. You know, we subsidize production. 
like more milk, even if nobody wants to drink it, more <laughs> milk, you know, uh, more theater, more everything. <coughs> we're not thinking about the real issues. You're here we are in a global society. We're not incentivizing that. That remains 0.1% of our cultural funding. And if you go to US foundations and try to make a case for funding international exchanges, you're gonna be unlikely to, to get a very positive response. It's always been the case. We thought after 9-11 it would change. I ran a conference at Columbia right after 9-11. It was called Arts and Minds, which I was very proud that we came up with a <laughs> clever title. And I did a study at the time of foundation support for arts exchanges, and we found that the year after 9-11, the sum of all arts exchanges with the Middle East was amounted to the average value of a one-bedroom apartment in New York City. So that was it. And 10 years later, the Robert Sterling Clark Foundation repeated the study and found that there was actually a decline. So state mechanisms are not equipped in the culture or elsewhere to uh, catalyze global cultural flow. And we have no, nobody minding, nobody looking after that. So we keep subsidizing and propping up our local institutions, but we're not doing, really not doing anything about this collaborative global aspect. You're saying we should sense. stop? Oh. I'm not saying we should stop, I'm saying we should be more nuanced. <coughs> Does that have, do you think, uh, to go to Tom's point about instrumentalization and then uh, to Erwin's point about um, sort of, well, what, you know, putting our, you know, putting our product out into the market, if you will, um, uh, is, 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 does that play a role? Is the idea is that, well, we're going to sort of take the frameworks of the free, you know, late stage capitalism and apply them to culture and say, well, it's another product that we want to get into other markets. We want to, you know, we want to treat it in that way. And I mean, in America, I mean, this is my political bias, obviously, but, you know, it feels that like government and business actually have, you know, separate, they're different things. And culture also is a different thing. Like it's not profit based in the same way that like a, a corporation should be. So it's like, is there an element of sort of applying uh, inappropriate frameworks to, to the exchange of ideas, or I don't know. I mean, I'm. I'm I don't really agree with you. I think within the dance scene, for example, collaboration internationally has been, it's the way that you do. That's the way that you progress, and that is funded because that is the high quality dance that you will see or performing arts and other things. But where do you go? Where do you go for the money? Sorry? Where do you go for the money? You go, I think you go internationally because that, I, I think that in, in some countries, and I think if you work with it, you will understand that the national quality of the arts will increase if your artists go abroad. Mm -hmm. because, because that's the only way that you will get that inspiration. But who's financing the progress. it? Yeah, who's financing it? There's so an example just for it's the government financing it. I, I can only speak from, from my side and where the internationalization is something that is emphasized every year to increase. Mm -hmm. And also in Europe, you have the European, the EU program funding system that is for culture because culture and the arts is the way that we can collaborate over the borders to get a better understanding. So I believe that it exists, but of course, the cultural policies would be from a national point of view. But if you speak about the arts and the culture, the only way to have a high standard in your country is if the artists go abroad. And I believe with the good examples, you can really do that. And we have that uh, collaboration between um, um, the Arts Grant Committee in Sweden and the Movement for Research in New York just for that, we have scholarships to go to New York and then come home and keep collaborating, mm -hmm. and keep moving, mm -hmm. and keep pushing the borders of the, <coughs> of the arts as well. So then the resources of, of the finances that you started to speak is like, you have your, um, your own government, let's say, who gives just a part of the funding, and now the, the yard, in a way, to, to collect uh, the fund that would be um, big enough for you as an artist to work is to really be able to collect it from different countries, different institutions, it's sort of, right. yeah, mm -hmm. puzzle working. Does this have an impact on the kind of work that's being made then as yes. well? Yes, you know, sure, And absolutely. it's interesting because on the one yeah. hand, you know, of course. it's something that uh, certainly we're finding in Ireland where the only way, you know, the, the sort of new thing that's happening in Ireland really for the first time is a focus on philanthropic support. Uh, on Previously, uh, philanthropic support up to now has only been 3% of uh, 
of the budget. And so everyone is kind of, suddenly everyone is talking about philanthropy and capacity building. And, um, and of course, you, you don't want to, um, uh, you know, I've talked about the, kind of the caution of not instrumentalizing the work. But on the other hand, I'm discovering that there are certain kinds of work, particularly, I'm thinking of participatory where actually the, it's possible social entrepreneurship um, where, uh, where it's possible for um, potentially non-cultural philanthropies to engage in supporting cultural projects. Um, but you know, if you're relying on a lot of international co-producers for a piece of work, there, you know, for example, there are very few companies, you know, I'm thinking of this, uh, there's a handful of companies in Europe making text-based work in English that can get a lot of European co-producers, for example, if you're not Simon McBurney or Chief by Jowl, um, that, you know, to get non-English speaking countries to co-produce the work, it means that there's, there's less money for that. And, um, and also, I suppose, when you think, you know, thinking about work that's directly engaging with the national condition, <coughs> which is something that, of course, the work should be doing, if you're having to fund work which is about uh, things that are happening locally and if you're trying to fund that internationally, um, th those challenges. So I, I suppose I'm interested in are, there, are people seeing that there are particular kinds of work um, is the funding having the, the kind of work that's made? I cannot get a national exchange funded in this country unless I'm going to a university and the university is supporting bringing someone in sort of a faculty role. Exchanges through the Ireland, which is we've expanding, and now the National Dance Project is created to use. So there is this trend in the dance world of moving in that collaborative direction. Scenario or scenario of reciprocity, and I think emerging artists how they're making work, how they're thinking <coughs> about work. Once they've sort of they're often staying there. Coming back to New York with their post office address here and raising. So it's becoming <coughs> very artist-driven and less institution-driven over time. It is tricky, though, because it came up yesterday at the International Forum as well, this EU system where uh, two countries, where you can apply with three countries together and then a separate country outside of the, UA, uh, uh, out of the EU for the USA. And indeed, uh, stuff came up with uh, uh, people in Holland being called, could you be our third partner? Uh, just mm -hmm. so they can apply for that. Uh, it, I think it is a very valid question, uh, but the residencies also came up in that discussion where I feel like, uh, for example, we have a residency set up uh, matching with uh, the Department of Cultural Affairs in Los Angeles, um, where the money we put in, they put in, and I think that is also a very interesting way of bringing these artists together because you do see long-term <coughs> relationships. Uh, companies that came to LA now are working with companies from LA and they bring the company from LA back mm -hmm. to Holland and vice versa. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I, I just find that these things are happening around the edges and they're not corresponding with the actual level of need or interest. I mean, right. you know, here we are. There's a whole group of people here on a Saturday. I mean, it, this is always what happens. There's tremendous interest in cultural exchanges. Usually there you know, panel discussions, whatever, it's always there. But actually the reality is if you look at the, the overall level of activity, it remains a sliver uh, in terms of our overall cultural activity. And while there are a few enlightened foundations, the Rockefeller Foundation has pretty much pulled out. Mm -hmm. Ford Foundation has de-emphasized the arts. Um, Pew Foundation has de-emphasized the arts. National Endowment now maybe will get into artist grants again. Their international program is tiny. Yeah. Um, 
I just wanted one little anecdote since we're more in like the dinner party modality, so I will share a little personal story. Um, years ago, I was um, sort of interviewing for a possible job to run a arts portion of a major foundation on the West Coast. And uh, this is the, one of the biggest arts funders uh, actually in the country. And, you know, we flew out meeting with the very smart, clever, young uh, foundation president. And um, so I thought, well, you know, I actually wasn't sure I wanted the job, but I thought, well, let's, let's just sort of really put this out there. So I said, you know, you should really make international exchange the main priority go going forward. This mm -hmm. is the state of California, you've got the Pacific Ocean, you've got this very diverse group of people. And he said, okay, um, I understand um, why we would uh, bring in arts from abroad. I understand that. We have all these people, they want to appreciate their heritage. But he, and this is not a trick question. This is an honest question. He said, make me understand why I should pay for our artists to go abroad. Mm. And this is not a trick question. And I think it's reflective of the mindset of our funding system, which is, a, which is all about feeding the starving mouths in your backyard. It's not about promoting global cultural interest. And that, that's what I think is the is issue here, is that there is a difference between, like Europe, where, and, I, and I, I definitely think, from what I understand, like Sweden, for example, there's a great interest and support for artists to go to America, for example, to train or have an exchange and then go back to Sweden or, and elsewhere. But is there really a climate in America and the United States for our artists where it's appreciated and supported and seen as valued for our artists to go elsewhere in the world and have an exchange. Well, because there is this sort of isolationist mentality in America <laughs> where we're the best and who needs to go anywhere else? And of course the artists are doing it. I mean, the, 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 the fact is that, you know, if we just look at the festivals that are in New York at the moment and the American work that's being shown in them, in fact, have been created. Never have produced Life and Times if it had been if they'd been relying on American funding. Mm -hmm. In fact, Nature Theatre Oklahoma is not a non-profit. Um, they've and you know there is an example of uh, an American theatre company working in England. Uh, European sources. Now that may dry up. Um, and then the question, I think, is how can we, uh, I mean, we're, we're now in a situation which actually I think is pretty damaging for um, our local institutions, local audiences here, where many preeminent young American artists are not creating work in the States, but are creating work internationally. And I would argue that, you know, that's actually not domestically necessarily in our, in our interest to lose artists of the caliber of, you know, Nigel, who develops most of his work in, of big art group, of nature theatre. Mm -hmm. um, so then, you know, my question as somebody who now runs an institution in the States is what can we do in How can we start being really entrepreneurial in the way that we partner with artists to create environments in which both um, local artists, New York City artists, national artists, but also international artists can come to the States and, uh, and develop work here. Um, and, I, you know, I, I, I always get a little concerned at these kinds of conversations that we spend the first hour and a quarter bemoaning uh, the situation, the crisis, mm -hmm. rather than, you know, taking a look at where, where there are success stories, where um, institutions, where individual artists are being really entrepreneurial in figuring out in, in the new reality how they can actually create work. And, the, and the, the, you know, the, because the fact is, work is still being created, and artists are being, uh, I think, enormously enlightened in the way that they are managing to put together projects, maybe very badly supported. You know, many of them may be operating at a bread line, many of them may come from mm -hmm. you know, uh, trust funds. Um, but, but I think that there are lessons that we can learn about how to, how to, to um, create support, and I, you know, the last thing that I just want to say is, you know, as somebody who, who has now spent really the whole of my career working on universities, I think what Barbara said very briefly is really important, 
which is that we're now in a situation where universities and colleges in this country are becoming de facto the major sources of support uh, for artists. And uh, I'm really interested in ways that we can break open institutions of higher education more and turn them into really valuable cooperative partners who are supporting artistic creation and understanding that having high caliber practicing artists around on campus um, is great for everybody. And universities are also international institutions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just, uh, you know, I think you should look at successes and then you should maybe look outside and further than the performing arts. But if you look at the, the Dutch culture, the most successful, that is parts that were never financed. It's electronic music. Design on, on, on the edge of, of art and commercial business, you know, the, the cultural. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to look at it. It is a part of photography. We have very successful photographers. And if you ask the people, what, why did you, hey, how did you manage to get successful without uh, governmental support? That's solidarity. They help each other. They are mm -hmm. working together. And they, and with the performing arts in the Netherlands, you can get your money. And once you get your money for four years. It's done. You don't have to you know, cooperate anymore uh, mm. with, with other partners. Uh, of course you want to uh, cooperate with the international because that's interesting. Uh, but there's no need to cooperate. And that's, I think that's a very interesting model. I, I, I'm just mm. finding it out lately. But uh, and I think that's something that the more traditional mm. arts uh, should have a look at. Right? You know, think out of the box because I agree with you. We are already, every time we go back to the funding, you know, what should the government do? And what is happening now in the Netherlands is the government is running after the success. They say, well, our uh, electronic music is very successful. They should be ambassadors of Holland. But they don't see us standing like uh, the government. <laughs> well, why would we? I mean, we never saw us uh, standing there. And now we should sell that we are Dutch. I mean, and the names are Afrojack. And uh, <laughs> you don't recognize it as Dutch anyway. Uh, but I think the performing arts, and this, that's an interesting angle to look at. Because if you look at the budget cuts in the Netherlands, that was 20%. I mean still doable, but of this 20 percent, 80 percent is by performing arts. So right. that's a big, uh, that's, that's really a huge budget cut, just going on one part. Why is that? Why, why is everything going on? And it's not really a problem in the Netherlands. I mean, for the performing arts it's a problem, but for the rest. But could I ask you, isn't the idea with state funding to fund the things that will not succeed without funding? If electronic music and photography and yeah, that's, design that's the, that's survives what the, without it, then we shouldn't support it. If you look, if you look into that, I mean, I'm, to be, to I'm the cultural attaché, so I look like how are we also right. selling our country. Maybe you should not. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe you should not invest in the things that could not happen without funding. Mm -hmm. Also, there's a, there's a, I mean, this actually really reminds me, without us submerging back into <coughs> the, the wallowing that you, you know, uh, I mean, this reminds me very much of the U.S. debates on funding. Why should we fund the arts? And I do think that there's a philosophical, if you will, question about what should funding be about. Because I think if you reduce funding to the idea um, of subsidizing products that otherwise wouldn't come about or wouldn't <coughs> be consumed, then that's a, that's a relatively narrow interpretation. A broader interpretation is how do you support with the tools of government, policy, funding, whatever, an ecology in which a certain kind of culture can thrive. Mm -hmm. And I think part of our problem has been that we keep slipping back into the mindset of one more season, one more play, one more party, mm -hmm. versus the, the, and this is what I think is so exciting about our moment, because some of these mechanisms seem to be uh, happening on their own. How do you create uh, in information mechanisms, networks, uh, sor sourcing uh, funding channels that, by the way, in the mainstream economy happen? I mean, if you think of uh, capital markets, you know, I bet you that every single country on the planet, you know, with the exception of North Korea, there are investors in Apple computing, you know. So whereas we have to sort of finance it on our own and then figure out a way to tour it. And similarly, our tariffs are very high. You know, especially, okay, not in the U.S. European relationship, but if you're trying to do t uh, productions with a Arab countries, um, you know, you have incredible visa problems, which is sort of the equivalent of putting a tariff on trade. It's an obstacle to trade. So mm -hmm. I think that there's a kind of ecological set of issues that we could address 
directories, databases, information, access to opportunities, matching people up, and that infrastructure is missing because the people who fund that infrastructure, whether it's government or foundation, are thinking about it. The problem I would is say that, uh, oh, sorry. Um, I, I agree uh, vehemently, and I think, I think to, to Gideon's point, I think there's a, it's, it's about reframing, I think, in a sense, what performing arts are now in the 21st century, in a way. Um, because if we, you know, look at the, you know, the, the, the work that interests me uh, tends to fall under the rubric contemporary, and I sort of feel that like there's two characteristics of it. One is investigative, in that you know they start from a question, not an answer, and that it's interrogative, that the sort of assumptions around like, well, this is a, you know, are 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 to be interrogated. And I think if we look at work being made in that way, then all of a sudden we're like, well, wait a minute, this is actually kind of research. And then if we start thinking, well, how do we bring like software development models into place? Or how do we bring scientific models into place? How do we publish research? How do we open the work to peer review? How do we look at a development process? And, and any product is not a finished product, but always sort of moving towards a more perfect iteration. I think, I think there's a way of, I mean, I think the thing is, is, that, is that, yes, text-based work that's hyper-local may not tour very well. And maybe that has a different sort of ecology around it, funding-wise, resource-wise, than work that's predicated on a, on a different context. But I think, um, I mean, that's very exciting. The idea that, like, well, how do we really, really look at, like, how information moves, how money moves, how things actually move in the global 21st century and start to build the big problem. One of the big problems in America is that the cultural production models are still predicated on, on like, Henry Ford's assembly line. You know, and it's like, well, how do you build a 21st century product when you're building like Model T cars? Mm -hmm. You know, and I think as institutions, people in institutions can start to think, okay, well, how is my institution based in this sort of like assembly or you know hierarchical model or whatever? How do we how do we how do we delink capital from you know this type of like structure and, and let it free in the market? How do we encourage? How do we build platforms uh, to allow information to travel more freely? Um, and uh, if anybody wants to fund it, you know. <laughs> for me, I think Sorry. it's, um, it's in, in, the, in a time uh, of really everything about economy and about money, I think the, actually the question is really about aesthetic, uh, because it, it will be affected. You know, not all money will go away, and safer things will be always present and easier to travel and will be used by states and cultural institutions to promote themselves. But then it will be just one side of, of, of culture and that's, that's very accessible, that's very uh, easy to... And that's where we, you know, the, the programmers have even more responsibility now to fund and try to find money and try to support <coughs> risky work. Now more than ever, and uh, and that is you know if uh, it's a silly support that's not depending on success, you know Pina Bausch should not happen because in the first few years she was you know slashed, mm -hmm. and that there are many examples I'm sure. But I would just also like to say I'm coming from Croatia, um, and we are in a constant state of of. Um, of crash, so we are still waiting for you at the bottom. <laughs> you are not, you are not there yet. But I can say, even when you hit bottom, things will not stop. You know, things will happen. It will just adapt in a way. And I just want to say that, for for example, for Croatia, it's a country in transition still. It was never behind the iron uh, curtain, but we did inherit the socialist uh, way of funding culture. And what happened with all over Eastern Europe is that. When the transition came 20 years ago, the state wanted to preserve the institutions, these huge, humongous you know, theaters with 600 employees, and that still is the case. So that's where the money goes. And actually, this crisis is having a positive effect in Croatia, because we are, the scene where I'm working, is in a growth. Why? Because the, now the state is trying to think to dis redistribute the money that already is there. So people in my field are actually receiving more money now, mm -hmm. so it will have hopefully a more positive uh, effect on the, um, on the scenery, artistic scenery for you know, smaller companies because now the National Theatre will not take 80% of, of the budget that uh, already is there. Doesn't your government try to commercialize at the same time some of the institutions? Because this is what happens, this is the darker side of this crisis. This is what happens, for instance, in, in Poland right now that 
If, um, as you have said, it's exactly the same way um, in, in my country that we inherited all these big institutions and the institutional theater works quite well, although uh, it's not very experimental. But um, it, so the government tries not to diminish this funding, but to redistribute it in the way. But then the result is that some of the theaters got uh, commercialized or become sort of private institutions and so on. So I don't see um, then probably you are just uh, um, in, a, in a much better situation because in, in Poland I don't see this um, this attitude to redis redistribute the money towards independent art scene. Not at all. I mean, then it's really a problem if the Balkans is the, the best example. <laughs> <laughs> but I, mean, also, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the focus on ecology and infrastructure and these things are important, but it's also, there's also a danger in terms of diminishing resources that the money gets spent on everything except the artists. You know, it's like, let's make all of these structures, yeah. but the artists can't develop them because they're all working in restaurants. Um, and I think, you know, that, that I think it, it's important, but it, it's also to, um, and I think, you know, the, to think about those, you know, the problem with looking at kind of, say, a software development model is that the end point of that is commercial. You know, that it's about at a certain point, you, uh, it becomes something which, you know, pays for itself. You know, there's the, and it is the problem with, you know, and this question about do you fund things which are never going to be able to pay for yourself because actually there is a certain kind of performing arts work which, uh, j because of the scale, because of the resources, it, it's a completely different model to, uh, to say, uh, uh, electronic music which you can make in your bedroom on your own and doesn't require bringing people together physically. Well, if, one, if, you, if you talk about models, I think it's really instructive to, we've all been reading all this recent articles about um, what's happening with universities and massively online courses. Yeah, you know, I mean, if there's one institution that's like Bigfoot institution straddling a cultural sector, it's the university. Like it doesn't get more, you know, bigger and, uh, and bureaucratic. And, and we all understand that all, so much of that funding is sucked into the university bureaucracy and the people who lose out are the public and the producers of the knowledge who get, uh, uh, you know, delinked <laughs> from uh, <laughs> jobs. <laughs> so, 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 and in the middle is this big hairy institution that's sucking up all the resources. So I think in that context, it's really interesting to watch what's going on with these courses. We've got, you know, 160,000 people lining up. I think that in a way there's, a, there's a, something we should be paying attention to. Share culture very widely uh, using new mechanisms. I think, in contrast, are in the 19th century. I think that there are models that are developing that allow culture, whether it's intellectual culture or artistic culture, to be shared across borders much more efficiently, and that these things can suddenly pop up. I mean, this this university thing really sort of suddenly is upon us and now right. everybody's sort of freaking out. What are we going to do? You know, most of all the formal universities who are now rushing to do it because they're afraid that now their market share is eroding. So I think that for us that's a very interesting model. I think because the, uh, I think the Gideon's example of Nature Theater of Oklahoma getting their money in Europe, we now start to almost see the opposite in certain ways with the universities where for example Carolina Performances is commissioning Netherlands Dance Theater for a new piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like the reversed world almost. Mm. It's in a way exciting uh, because it means that these universities indeed are starting to take up a role uh, of creating new works that comes that is already an international exchange. Um, so well, they do have the capacity. Exactly. You know, yeah. and uh, I think I don't want to lose track of the audience and our culture. Like, like we have this thing called the cultural wars, which woke up a lot of people in the, uh, the US, uh, is that like, oh, we weren't including everyone. Yeah. Because when our, just as when uh, in the in Netherlands, like they, there wasn't this intense protest about you're cutting all the performing arts. It, and it, uh, uh, so, and it happened here as well. You know, we found, you know, Hollywood actors going, yeah, I don't care about the NBA. You know, and so, uh, 
I think there's a, always a lot more politics we need to work right. as far as and continuing lifting the discussion about why this why should there be international exchange and I think we're running into it always with like well I have starving artists, artists in my backyard why you know why should I also fund uh, Fund for this exchange. Right. You know, I think also, there's a, also, just when you talk about the budgets, I think we also have to stop whipping ourselves that we are always justifying the little you know budgets that we get because the budget of the state and totally is crazy. You know, uh, <laughs> military. I, I read yeah. somewhere that the in the U.S. The, the military orchestras get more money than all the orchestras. I mean, it's yeah. that is the balance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we just need to also step back and see that we are doing the best we can with little uh, mm -hmm. that we have. But I, I think, Mark, I think they're actually intertwined, the points that you make with, um, because, you know, one of the big, you know, one of the, one of the reasons that, you know, is, is, is that Kaiser essay, uh, you know, on Huffington Post, you know, low those two years ago, you know, where he basically, you know, said that, you know, audiences should have no opinions and they shouldn't comment on websites and anybody, you know, and he was basically like, you know, I think I think this sort of 19th century production model and this sort of huge institution arts model has, that's why nobody gave a hoot when the NEA went down because it's always been this, well, we're the titans of culture and you masses will come be educa educated by us rather than seeing the arts as something that's actually generative, creative, and, you know, people actually do um, and, and, and respond to and I think um, and live with and that, you know, in fact, you know, most of the arts audience, not most, but you know, like there's just not that many jobs in the arts or not many you know, people that are willing to like take them. <laughs> and um, you know, so the, an arts audience is often made up of a very thoughtful, engaged people. And, and for years, people at the arts establishment has been, been like, ah, screw you. Yeah. And I think that like, to Tom's point, it's not about building more structures. Mm -hmm. It's actually about breaking down all these huge sort of like brick, sponges, if you will, you know, bricks and mortar sponges that suck up capital, you know, in, um, and, and sort of figuring out, well, how do they, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we, re, how do we re-examine the role of capital and also revenue models? Like, I mean, come and, you know, I mean, there's a different aesthetic proposition between going to see The Lion King are similar. You know, I buy a ticket, I sit in my seat, I watch the show, I leave. And so if we start um, and start saying, well, what is, you know, is the revenue model for what this type of work is the same as for that type of performance is? And, you know, and so when I say software development, it's like, yeah, there may not be an end product, but maybe, you know, the, the musician that's you know, that's collaborating, develops an awesome CD during the process. Or like when I saw the show, the, the big musical show with the detectives and everything that you did a couple years ago. And <laughs> like that was a great, yeah. you know, musical. You know, and that, like, maybe that's the, I don't know, I mean, I think, I, think, I, I, I really have no idea, but I guess what I'm saying is that, is that I, I feel like what's exciting to me about this moment is, but, is what horrifying is, but is also exciting is that actually everything's up for grabs. I thought it was interesting what Taylor Mack said in his um, provocation on the birthday where he said, I think Richard Foreman is commercial theatre. I think everything that everyone is talking about here is commercial yeah. theatre. And the idea of actually, um, but how we, also how we sort of, uh, yeah, reframe what that audience engagement is and how we, and you know, also that we kind of sort of stop apologising, you know, for the work being surprising and difficult and interesting and um and he's talking what you you hit on one thing that this is a great moment but as these things are melting down and there is a little bit more chaos this is where we can really make some statements and get some different structures or or reinvent these things and it's a really exciting moment but i think i think what what's happening here too i mean we're here we're sitting we all agree <laughs> as always, I mean, yeah, as, as always. always. I mean, yeah. that, that's also I'm why these, these kind of meetings are a bit getting a bit boring because everyone, you know, actually should step out to the people who are yeah. not really trying to get them in. I mean, what happened in mm -hmm. the Netherlands was just before the elections, the, the right wing party, which is not that right wing, I mean, it's a liberal party, they were much bigger than this one, and he was stating to the cultural field, like, you should come up with a good story. I mean, I'm an art lover, if you don't come with a good story, 
you're going to be 250 right. million. He was mentioning the, the number exactly. That's going to be the budget cut. Boo! Go away. You don't understand yeah. it. He did that once ago, <coughs> just before the election. There was no story 250 million. He knew it already uh, before. And that's what's happening still in the Netherlands. The cultural field is not stepping outside. They are not starting to convince the people who don't believe in culture. Uh, and, and that's, I think, where they start. I mean, it's good to sit here, but actually we should sit here. I should sit here, and you should all disagree with me. I just oh. want to throw in another country into the mix. I'm who are you? Oh. I'm, my name is Avia Moore. I'm on the panel, the fourth panel. And I'm a Canadian, which is a rather large part of North America, um, <laughs> perhaps not population-wise. but. Um, we are kind of straddle the middle of the cultural production spectrum and that we do have state funding both on a provincial level and on a government uh, federal level but um it is it is uh, a bit of a a lot of terror going on in the arts community as we watch it getting cut um particularly by the conservative government that we have right now and but one thing i have noticed as i look at the, the funding uh, landscape starting to change in Canada is that there does seem to be an emphasis from uh, the Canada Council for the Arts, which is the primary federal. But um, they seem to be emphasizing international exchange and international touring, um, as well as national touring. But there seems to be an emphasis on collaboration. And um, optimistically, I would like to think that that's actually about bringing things back into Canada, and that's the argument. Um, my argument may be a somewhat optimistic one. I think that the, there, there's something about selling the country as well, but when you, when you apply for these programs, the, the primary question, and I actually find this similar on an uh, academic forum, I, also, I went abroad to do academics, and um, they always ask you what you're going to bring back. What are you bringing back to Canada? They don't want to fund you if you're just going to go and stay. They want to know what you're going to contribute to the Canadian scene, whether academically or culturally. And, and again, here's my optimistic standpoint, but I would like to think that it's about shaking up these hierarchies. You know, we can bring back models from other places that do shake things up. We have a regional system in Canada, a regional theater system, that's not particularly experimental. But and the people who are going away and creating work in other places or going away and studying, uh, whether it's in Europe or England or Latin America or Asia, are, are bringing back new models and new ways of working that, that shake up that regional theater scene. I, I agree with your optimism and I particularly like the fact, well, I, I do think there's reasons for optimism mostly outside of the Euro-American relationship because from uh, China to Brazil to Mexico, countries are other countries are ramping up, mm -hmm. um, and there's huge opportunities uh, there. Um, and actually, those are the relationships we should really be worried about. I mean, you know, in the end, Europe, U.S. They're always going to be a cultural dialogue. But I think going back to the larger picture, yeah. I do think that the cultural community does ne need to wake up to a few facts in order to survive in this new. Uh, one is that they are going to be held accountable. And whether you like it or not, whether it's governments or private funders, individual funders, I, I know we all hate this, uh, but we are going to have to demonstrate why what we do is valuable in ways that doesn't involve a Shakespeare quote, but probably a statistic. Mind you, that could be of a softer <coughs> kind of statistic. It doesn't have to be about you know number of cups of coffee consumed. It can be something more meaningful. The other is that I think we can't hide behind the idea that um, we're experimental and use this as a justification if the audience doesn't care about what we do. And uh, I think we can look at the mainstream world in all of its guises, long tail or massively centrally produced, that, that we can't deny the role of the audience in what we do. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a, another thing. And the, and the third thing, perhaps, is that we need to wean ourselves off government. And I say this mostly to my European friends. We misunderstand the role of government, I think. We had a panel once, maybe you were there, here in New York about cultural exchange, and it was the usual thing, uh-oh, funding is going down, government doesn't get us. And then finally somebody said, you know, it, you used the word whipping ourselves, said, why are we always talking about how we can be instrumentalized and how we could do such a great job, uh, you know, helping a country project its image? 
why aren't we like every other sector that looks at government and says, what, do you, what have you done for me lately? You know, uh, whether you're a trade group for the uh, anti-piracy issues in the software, uh, or uh, you, know, you represent farming, or you represent aerospace, you, you don't come looking for subsidies. You're looking, you're saying, um, what are you doing for me as a government as an important part of your GDP and as an important mm -hmm. piece of yes. your national economy? What are you doing as a government to promote me? Absolutely. And I think that we, we should be okay with that language. But, I think but Holly, Hollywood is, but the arts are not. But I think it's important that there's an opportunity that maybe the competition should be about how do we take a more proactive role in terms of at what that accountability is, how right. we, um, you know, that, that the terms of success are ones that we can define exactly. rather than, you know, just needing to borrow success from, you know, how other industries work, but actually that there's a conversation which is about how do we define this shared agenda and actually, you know, that there are, I mean, I think that's interesting what you talk about the Netherlands, where actually he's going, I love art, you're just going to have to tell us a story that makes us not cut 250 million. And that to do that together, and to, mm -hmm. that it's not a dirty thing to learn to speak mm -hmm. other languages. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. But on the other hand, that it's also to communicate actually what the value is. Uh, but, to, uh, but it means that we actually really need to think about that and not take it for granted. You know, I think it's interesting with Canada. I mean, it's not a coincidence that we're presenting five new works from uh, young Canadian companies in Cork, and it's been, you know, it, it, like it's. I found it so uh, easy, um, and it feels that that policy is really, certainly for me, having an effect in terms of the amount of time I'm able to spend there. You know, we've made it. We've co-produced one of these pieces that we're presenting, um, and uh, you know, certainly I think that of, of all of the models that I've been engaging with over the last eighteen months in my capacity in Cork, the Canadian model seems one that uh, that uh, I'd love to see some other governments emulating, actually. I also think that we should define what success is, because I believe that in success the Belarus Free Theatre are here. They mm. have, do not have governmental support. Mm. State funding is different in different countries, and in some countries perhaps you shouldn't have state funding. In Hungary, perhaps we would have a group here next year that got their money otherwise, because that is what we want to see. That might be success. Mm -hmm. And in the Nordic countries, if we support and give funding that will give new perspectives on freedom of speech, that would be a success for us to yeah. fund. So success is always <coughs> something that you can define, and statistics is something that you can discuss what yeah. that is. And I believe that that can be a successful funding from the state. And I, I, think, just, yeah. I think for the, um, just speaking from the artist side, I uh, work with the Wooster Group, that, um, W one thing that has changed for us over 40 years is that um, when we first started going to Europe, we were invited because there was an excitement about the aesthetic exploration that the company was doing. <coughs> and I feel um, that recently, when we're invited places, it's usually because there's another agenda to, um, because they want to <coughs> pick things up or because um, they want to, um, um, say that they presented the Worcester Group because there's some, you know, cachet to that, I guess, or um, there's an agenda to reach a certain community, um, but it's usually not because they're passionate about the work. And um, uh, but we're still passionate about the work, and we like reaching uh, different audiences. We're very happy to be used in a way, but I think you have to be cognizant of that, of how you're using artists to, for other ends, to meet other purposes. And when we talk about audience, just when you met, there's always this discussion that you have to justify yourself because the public, you know, um, you're not selling enough tickets. But for me, I think I understand a little bit in Croatia what, where the problem there can be, where you always have to defend that you're not elitist or whatever. But the, the audience that you are trying to hit is actually uneducated. The, the public system doesn't, I mean the education system, art education does not exist properly anymore and in Croatia it stops in mid 19th century. So when people are uh, used to read things with eyes that can only read uh, linear things or literal things or traditional concepts, traditional plays, 
of course, when you come to an experimental show, you don't see it. You don't, you don't have the skill to see it with the different eyes and to appreciate it. And I think there is, it's a lot also to do with this outdated idea about art, that you have to come and admire the beauty or whatever. That's the 19, that, you know, that stopped then. But we moved on. And that may be, you know, also a target how to justify the arts in the future. You know, the, the, the arts education in schools is something that has to come back uh, there. Well, I, I think you. I think that to to sort of try and re respond to some of all of them. Um, I, the problem I think, Jan, is, with the, with what is the story is that at least in America, is that you actually come up come up against a very difficult situation because I, from my perspective, one of the what you're talking about is like giving the general world an opportunity to create to look at at non-traditional work and inviting them into a process that may may and and giving them the tools to do so um you know what you're what you're talking about is is and i guess there are some people that adhere to a certain sort of set of like the idea of of, of, of um the, the sort of the social contract of civic space and that somehow the conversations that we have through contemporary performing arts are supportive of Building a stable society in a way, and I, I and I, that may be wrong. Like that may be instrumentalization. I don't know, but I feel like you know there. You know, in the fifties, America subsidized certain types of art to go abroad because they wanted to show that we were, you know, progr you know, progressive and modern and not Moscow. Or you know, they sent tap dance because they wanted to show you know how great entertainers we are. Um, and I think that. I'm not sure how to articulate this other than I feel like when you start to ask, well, why is it good? Then you start to get to sort of these really fundamental questions about like, well, what is our society supposed to be like? And those conversations are really hard to have. Right. Yeah, but the difference between you and, and Gracia and Melo is you are focusing on people who understand experimental art and they are, that's where you find the financing. But in, in the Netherlands, it's completely paid by the taxpayer. I mean, and that's what, that is the problem. I mean, if you cannot, and the people who are voting, mm -hmm. and, and that's a completely different story. So if there is a political party writes down cut, uh, budget cuts on culture because uh, we don't understand and uh, I can do it myself better than, you know, look at this. I mean, th yeah. th these discussions you are having in the Netherlands, if either we like it or not. So you can focus on, on, on the people who should fund and, 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 and pay their tickets. But in, in, in Europe, you have to explain something to, to the Civil society. <laughs> but, but, I, but I'm saying, what is called, I mean, I think the whole and, 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 and I don't say, like, you should start to do something else, or, but you, you need to have a story that people will vote for the party that say we should spend more on culture. Right. Well, I mean, I, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I guess when I look at work like Rumini Protocol or artists who are doing this, this socially engaged practice, I feel like that is actually a really good argument for, like, it's like experimental insofar as it's not a play. But I mean, it's actually something that is very accessible and is built in community. Um, and, I, and, and so when we talk about sort of different, um, uh, I guess I, I guess I feel like there is a there is a story to be told that and try. I mean, I, an artist said to me, well, I was talking about the Marina Abramovich show up at uh, MoMA. He said, well, there, you couldn't get further from Broadway. I'm like, actually, Marina's pretty Broadway, <laughs> you know. I mean, she's a huge personality, like it's glitz and glamour and people are waiting in line and paying lots of money, you know, to go. And that's, you know, in the 70s, she was kind of, you know, experimental, but now she's Broadway. So I think that there's actually like, I think there's a framing, you know, and I like I agree, like we do have to come up with a story, but I don't think, and, I, and we're not doing a good job of it, but... I, but I mean, when I come back, I think I want to go back to where you started, which I think all these comments remind me ultimately of this segmented reality. I think that we, on both sides of the Atlantic, are feeling our way in two major respects. One is how do we put Humpty Dumpty back together again as far as financing, as far as a sustainable culture? And the other is how do we advocate a role uh, for culture in a global society. And those are things that are works in progress and we're also scratching our heads. And, but we're sort of getting there bit by bit. I think that for, for me this is a whole separate reality from <coughs> cultural diplomacy. Ooh. And I actually would like to make a strong case for that cultural diplomacy because I think whether it was after 9-11 where everybody looked up and said, holy shit, they don't, you know, there's an issue here or now with places like Budapest and, and Croatia and, and 
uh, parts of Eastern Europe are really falling off the cliff, I think it's really time for some good old-fashioned propagandistic, instrumentalized uh, cultural diplomacy where we sort of take <laughs> place, because I know, I grew up in, I left Hungary in 1988, I know how much it meant mm -hmm. to get Woody Allen or the abstract expressionist or Charlie Parker, and I know that in today's Budapest, 2013, whether it's the Wooster Group or the 40 year younger version of the Wooster Group, it would be a big deal. It would speak uh, truth to power and it, at a time when it's needed. Mm. And, and I think that's an old fashioned rationale for old school cultural diplomacy, and there's a room for that as well, which is yeah. a whole separate thing from everything else. Yeah, but what you were saying about uh, that story, uh, when we had the conversation about cultural diplomacy in Georgetown uh, last year, that whole idea came up as well, the, the, the measurements of the arts and what are you measuring, uh, because it becomes very important that you now see a shift to indeed that the artists and the, the presenters are measuring uh, economically in Europe because they have to, mm -hmm. um, and is that the right way to go? Obviously not, we don't think so. Um, but that comes back to the story, what do you tell? What is the story? Uh, why is it uh, not on an economic level important, but on the other level, which for us is such a given, but uh, it somehow got lost in the way in the conversation with the audience, with mm -hmm. the, the well, society. This, I mean, this is where I, to, to, to the old fashioned you know, thing, it's like, I think it is about ideas and it's, it's right. about sort of, I mean, I think we still have not had, at least I haven't been invited, to have like a meaningful multiculturalism conversation across the divide. You know, the way Americans deal with multicultural issues right. and the way Europe deals with multicultural issues. Right. And let's face it, that's probably the number one issue with, 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 with so many uh, uh, people leaving their countries of origin and moving around the globe and the juxtaposition of different cultures and, and, and diaspora and economic shifts actually Dealing with people, uh, keep maintaining Western-style democracy in a in a in a polyglot world right. is is actually very very. You know, we handle it very very differently. America has a very very different history uh, than Europe does, um, and we're we're not having that conversation. So it's like it's like, but culture is a great way to have that conversation. Um, but I don't know anybody that's actually saying, "Hey, let's let's talk about that." You know why? You know, uh, you you come here, you know, under the radar, and you and you see, you know, the the conversation happening from multiple perspectives. And uh, but um, I, I, I'm I'm sorry, but I'm sort of building up on what you said, which is which is that I, there are many good arguments for what culture can totally. be instrumentalized you know, to do. One of the things happening with me is going to just change the whole uh, conversation. But, um, the I'm and I'm moving abroad uh, for a bit of a time, and um, so I'm going to be a foreign correspondent for the public theater. And uh, it's interesting, like how many theaters uh, or institutions, cultural institutions in the U.S. above, have an idea of a global thing. We all know we all talk about we're in a global world, but actually and I'm going to be trying to develop with Oscar and the, people, the artistic team here, what is our, our international policy, in a way? Why, do we, why would we bring this piece from Hungary and not this piece from the Congo? Or, you know, so it's going to, I'm, that's one of the things I'm facing through all of this. Mm. And the other thing, that now that you can work anywhere, um, people are able to choose where they want to work. And so, Many of the folks uh, in India are staying home because they can work and, and still get their uh, paycheck from Microsoft. So it's becoming a lot about what, what the quality of communities are. So uh, if I move to the West Coast, I think I'd pick Portland, you know, um, because it has a cultural, it, it's a good cultural environment. It's a good place to raise your kids up. Uh, but the culture is becoming very important in those ways, in the way people look at their communities and what's, you know, what's happening. Uh, well, it, to, it almost goes back to what Tom was saying quite a bit ago, which is like, well, how do you maintain, uh, you know, because, you know, we, uh, how do you maintain the local in a global context? It's like the awesome part about living in Portland is what Portland is. Um, or actually, I would, is Kara here? Anyway, I had a conversation about San Francisco, um, and they, we were talking about how hard it is in New York, because in New York, when you're an artist, you feel like you do a show and you just can't fail, like it's, the stakes are so high. And this person was saying, like, in San Francisco, the problem is, like, you know, the problem is, like, in San Francisco, you just, 
can't fail, man, because no matter what you do, it's good. You, you <laughs> so it's like, that's a local condition, you know, but how do we have that converse, you know, how do we, I don't know. Well, one thing that we, I, oh. I just wanted to respond to what you said about the culture being a, a source, speaking about multiculturalism and other things. I think the most important thing in, in that is that culture has to be strong for culture's own sake. Because if we take culture to help you, help kids get better in school, if you use culture to get a lower blood pressure, if you use culture <laughs> to solve poverty, what do we do when it doesn't do that? Because mm -hmm. that, that's when the person will come and say, culture didn't do this, cut the budget. So we have to find that story and say when culture okay, well, I didn't say that it should be instrumental. No, no. <laughs> no, I'm just saying that, that well, it's I, a question I that you want to use, but you have to be so careful doing that. Because if that yeah. isn't a good way to have the dialogue, okay, let's it's not use culture. So you have to yeah. be so careful doing and, that. And this is a lesson that Europe cannot try to copy American this because it was a dead end street here. And that there is a great danger right now yeah. that we see a replay of what happened here in the 90s, where basically after the culture wars, the cultural community obliged the powers that be by developing this new set of, you, know, you could no longer say art is great because that was under attack, so okay, we instrumentalized it. We said it's gonna be reading mm -hmm. scores and right. low tax, you know, high tax rates and white collar jobs, and, and that was a complete dead end yeah. argument. Yeah. Yeah. Because number one, if that's what you want, if you want safe streets or healthier kids, is really the, the smartest way of going about that by like putting on more plays and then waiting two years later for the social effects to come. You know, it seems like not an efficient policy. Number two, the demonstrated outcomes never really came. But more importantly, you, you sort of, you, you were no longer advocating for our arts as arts. And, and I think the single biggest mistake we made uh, here, or they made, was that they, they, they wanted these metrics and they went to the wrong scientists. So, so they went to the economists. Mm -hmm. because it was sort of the obvious thing. And the, uh, the economist, you know, when you have a hammer, you look for a nail. So the economist said, hey, we can develop metrics. So guess what? Now all of our metrics are, you know, uh, economic metrics. Um, if we had gone to different scientists, if we had gone to the behavior psychologists, right. mm -hmm. um, and, and we would have had, we would still have ended up with metrics, but they would have been different metrics. So maybe one thing that Europe can help us do or where we could sort of, you know, work together as you were saying, is that we need to uh, work in the direction of better metrics. The metrics issue is not going to go away, but we don't have to go down the same dead end street. Yeah, and mm. this is exactly the conversation that was had at Georgetown in this meeting, where, uh, and Diane Ragsdale was, for example, very, yeah. very clear in that also, where she said that's going in the very wrong direction if you go to those economic metrics. Uh, we'll and lose. We'll yeah, lose. we lose. We'll we lose. totally will lose. Right. And a great report, or I mean great, but it's, it's a try to go into other scientists, yeah. was uh, from the British Council, the Trust Pace report, where they're actually trying to measure in a different way. Yeah. Uh, of course, it takes much longer times, often, uh, to measure that other uh, outcome. And the irony is that the economists themselves have moved in that direction, so it's uh, they've questioned the GDP, it's National right. Wellbeing Index, I mean there's a lot of very progressive economic thinking that also tries to have a, a broader view right. of the um, of social benefits. So I think that's a lot of work to be done and we need to loop all of that back, back mm -hmm. in, because I think accountability is not going away, but accountability to what? Yeah. Yeah. On that note, <laughs> Thank you, everyone. It's not over. It's just a try. So carry it on. Thank you. Everyone.